I was looking one time, like, what well, what is the size of like the Social Security Fund or something in the United States? And I think it was like two trillion or something. So, I mean, <laughs> you can almost play with the number. Like, if crypto goes up another thousand x in the next ten years or something, it's um, it's not. There's a lot of people who are already today have become billionaires from crypto, and a lot of them are interested in philanthropy. So it's like, I, I mean, this might sound crazy, but if you get a good fund together and then crypto goes up a thousand x, it could be like the size of the U.S. Social Security Fund at some point. Hello world, it's Siraj, and welcome to my podcast. My next guest is a friend and someone whose name and company have both become synonymous with cryptocurrency, Brian Armstrong. Brian is the founder of Coinbase, a company dedicated to creating an open financial system for the world. Years ago, when he was a software engineer at Airbnb, he saw how many difficulties arose when dealing with cross-border payments. And this, along with reading the Bitcoin white paper by Satoshi Nakamoto, inspired him to improve those inefficiencies by starting Coinbase. Coinbase has now grown to over 750 full-time employees, manages billions of dollars in wealth, and has served over 30 million customers globally, making it the largest crypto company on the planet. But what inspires me about Brian the most is how he has stuck to his original motivations this whole time, giving the poorest 10% of the world a way to earn an income, decreasing corruption, and increasing personal liberty through cryptocurrency. So with that said, it's my honor to introduce the man who has helped catalyze countless innovations in digital currency, Brian Armstrong. Thanks, Siraj. That was a great intro. Thanks for spending some time with me today. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, lots of questions I want to ask, but we have to start off with the obligatory, what is Bitcoin for people who don't know? Oh, yes. Well, Bitcoin is a decentralized digital currency. So what does that mean? Uh, well, decentralized just means that there's no company or country that controls it. It's um, just made up of a bunch of participants all over the world who can run some software on their computer. And digital currency um, is kind of like an electronic version of money. You could think of it like um, currency that's native to the internet. So um, instead of sending around, you know, made up points or some uh, dollars that's specific to one country, you know, the internet is inherently global. So it might as well have a global currency. And uh, that's what Bitcoin is, is a decentralized digital currency. Well said, well <laughs> said. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I've been in the space for a couple of years. And so... I can only imagine what your emotions must have been when you saw that the president of the United States, Donald J. Trump, tweeted about Bitcoin. I went wild in different ways, but I want to start with you. Like, well, I know you re you uh, responded to it on Twitter, but what was your initial emotional reaction when you when you saw that? Yeah, I mean, I was kind of I was excited actually. Um, the the government over the years, um, there's kind of just been a series of milestones where crypto has. You know, initially, people are kind of scared of it, or they um, they laugh at it, um, and they think it's a toy. And then and then they you know they get um, you know they want to actually block it, or they get scared of it. And then eventually, they start to see the potential of it, and they slowly adopt it. So it's almost like you know going through like the stages of grief, where you're like bargaining, ex acceptance, or whatever. So I've seen a lot of people go through this over the years. Um, you know, Jamie Dimon's going through his own <laughs> path to realize that um, we've had many interactions with very positive interactions, you know, with the Treasury and the SEC and various regulators and um, the IRS and people like that. We're just as a company in 2012, um, we made a, a really conscious decision that we wanted to proactively go reach out to regulators and banks and educate them about this technology. And so we were sort of like the legitimate people who would suit up periodically and go to these meetings and just kind of explain it. And um, usually, I can't tell you how many meetings I went to where, you know, people were like, kind of didn't even want to meet with us until um, somebody they trusted convinced them, all right, I'll take a meeting with these crazy crypto people. And then we showed up and an hour later, they were like, well, I still don't, you know, I, I trust this a little bit more. So anyway, long way of saying we've been doing many, many meetings like this over many years. And uh, finally, it got to be the president of the United States. Um, I had had like kind of, I'd always dreamt that that would happen eventually, like the president of the United States would eventually have to respond in some way to growing cryptocurrency usage. Um, and of course, you know, he has kind of a conflict because um, the US dollar is sort of like their own <laughs> their own product so everyone's kind of talking their own book you know i'm talking my own book like i'm i'm into crypto of course 
Bitcoin is not our product. It's a totally globally decentralized thing. Um, but the U.S. president, I would expect to pitch their own book, dollars, and I would expect every other country to pitch their own thing. Um, so I just think of it as like it was a cool little milestone on the way to the world getting more interested and uh, educated on crypto. Yeah, I, I felt the same way. Like even though it was negative, I was elated. I was just like, oh my God, it's <laughs> rare to see a tweet that's so exciting. The fact that he even mentioned it was was super exciting. And and you spend you spend some time on Twitter, right? Like you you tweet and how active would you say you are on Twitter? Oh, I, I mean, I probably tweet like a couple times a week. Um, I have kind of this uh, <laughs> love-hate relationship with Twitter. I mean, I, I love that I'm able just to read um, thoughts from really interesting people who I follow and it, it's like very intellectually stimulating. I learn a lot from it. Um, I'm always a little bit, I'd say over the years, I've gotten like a little more authentic on Twitter or just like putting out my own stuff. Um, occasionally I put something out and there's just so many angry people that like respond. So I just, I have a kind of a policy of like, I just never read the replies. Um, a lot of smart. people engage on Twitter and they really, their followers are somehow nicer or something. So they can actually like do Q and A and dialogue. And it's actually a real live discussion. I, I've been being more authentic, but I try to actually, um, never read the comments. <laughs> yeah. That's super smart. I've been looking at some of the replies. They are, yeah, they are brutal. Like, cause it's not even about, I mean, it's about, it's not even about you. It's about their own. People are just in a dark place sometimes. And it's, yeah, yeah it's crazy because there's money involved. That's, that's the real difference. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, everybody owns like their favorite coin or whatever. And so they're out there kind of, um, but yeah, it's kind of, that's a whole separate topic, but yeah, Twitter is kind of sometimes feels like more of like a bullying platform or something, which is, uh, which is weird. I almost wish there was like a, just turn off comments yes. feature, or I would only see comments from people that were, um, that I follow or that were like very highly rated or some threshold of like what comments I would see, but I don't know. I'm sure they're working on it. Totally. Totally. Yeah. yeah. I, I will admit I have like muted some people just because even though, you know, I'm doing things for free. So generally the comments are nice. Even then, like there are some people who are haters still. Mm -hmm. And what I've done is just like mute them because I don't want to block them from my content. I just don't want them to enter my, have free rent in my brain mm -hmm. you know, by thinking about that, which is yeah. uh, an interesting part of human psychology. Yeah, I think that's one of those keys to happiness is like um, you should never allow some random person to like put something on the screen um, in front of you. So I, I have turned off all those notifications. And this, yeah. Life is too short. <laughs> Absolutely. And okay, so speaking about keys to happiness and um, companies who I consider are not as much in the game of giving people the keys to happiness like Facebook, but we all have our separate opinions. <laughs> Facebook is releasing their own, I guess you could call it cryptocurrency, Libra, um, soon. I don't. I haven't seen any interviews or anything uh, regarding your opinion on Libra. So this might yeah. be a, a premiere right here. So what do you what do you think of uh, Libra? Yeah, I was thinking about tweeting something out on that. A lot of people have been asking me about it, but um, this is the first time I've probably talked about it. So um, so I'll give you the, kind of the bull and the bear case for, for Libra. And, and just high level before I get into that, I mean, I think it's one of probably six or seven really interesting projects coming out in crypto that should be people should follow. Um, I mean, the amount of press that it got and the amount of people um, asking me about it is like d very disproportionate to the other six or seven. But um, I'd say it's equally interesting as some of those other ones. Long way of saying there's a lot of really cool like next gen protocols and things. The crypto space is just evolving really well. Um, so the bear, the bull and the bear case. Uh, the bull case for, for Libra is that um, Facebook has, you know, one to two billion monthly active users that they can introduce to crypto. And that would be huge. I mean, today, probably only 50 million people in the world own um, Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. And that would be, you know, a couple orders of magnitude increase from there if they started to expose people to it. Um, another thing, you know, people I'd say in, in the pro column is that, well, sorry, I don't want to make this too pro. It's 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 somewhere in between. Um, people always talk about, well, is it decentralized or is it centralized? And I think they think of it as almost like a binary thing, like, are you decentralized or not? And it's really more of like a spectrum. So, you know, on the left side of the spectrum, maybe the most centralized thing is like, one um, person or country or company, you know, controls it um, like Visa or, you know, I think the U.S. dollar has like a few a Federal Reserve chairman or something like that um, or one Federal Reserve chairman, but a couple, um, I forget what they call the next position down. And then the most decentralized thing would probably be like Bitcoin, right? Where it's anybody can run it on their own laptop anywhere in the world. Um, many, you know, tens of thousands of nodes and that kind of thing. So 
Libra is somewhere in the middle. It's today it has about 25 companies that make up this consortium. Um, it's a common misconception. People think it's a Facebook coin. Well, really, there's about 25 companies that are in this consortium, and Facebook is one of them. Coinbase is another one, um, and each one of them has equal voting power. Then eventually, there'll be about 100 of those or so. So it, it's is it sufficiently decentralized? You know, the answer is is maybe. I think in practice, it would be pretty difficult for someone to come in and um, kind of send a court order to one company and say, seize these funds or block this or something. They'd have to do it to, I believe, like a third of the companies um, that are in the consortium. And um, that just as a practical matter, that'll be kind of difficult, especially as they add more members that are outside the US. There's only a couple today. So I think in practice, it could be fairly decentralized. Um, and, and of course, the other pro is they'll get one to two billion people potentially exposed to this thing. I guess the other thing I like about it too is that it has a basket of fiat currencies backing it, and including other things like crypto. Um, you know, crypto I think is probably the better long-term solution, but as an interim solution, it's nice to have a basket of currencies because I think, you know, um, people in China they don't want to necessarily use like a U.S. dollar coin or in, in India or places like that. So what's the bear case for Libra? Right, it's not all rosy. I mean, one downside to it is that um, because it has still kind of a U.S. regulatory um, nexus to it, it's not going to be able to be a truly global um, cryptocurrency. So, you know, in the U.S., uh, via OFAC rules, you can't um, send money into um, Iran and North Korea and places like that. And so, and honestly, there's probably people in those countries that would benefit from having more stable currency and financial and economic freedom, right? So in that sense, it doesn't really offer the promises of like a true decentralized cryptocurrency. Um, you know, there's another downside to it, which is that Facebook's brand is really struggling right now. And um, I, you saw like Congress has reached out and everything to kind of really put pressure on it. So will people trust it with, you know, I think it's a misconception, like it's, it's not a Facebook coin, but Facebook is sort of, it was came out of that as an idea. And now it's in this consortium with Facebook, Facebook being one of the members. Will people be able to understand that and separate the two in their mind? Unclear. Um, yeah, and I guess if there's maybe um, one more thought on it, I don't know. It's just, it hasn't gotten, it's not like live yet, right? So there's, it's not live, yeah. yeah, there's just a test net. Um, they're gonna try to do it in a year. Consortiums in financial services have traditionally not been very successful. Um, there might be one example, like I've been reading this book about the history of Visa and how it was founded uh, by the founder. Do you know, what's it called? Um, if you remember. It's something about like, uh, cha the chaotic organization and the, the monkey mind or something it has like okay. a crazy name. I gotta remember that. <laughs> yeah. By D Hawk. But, um, you know, that might be the exception that proved the rule. Cause I think when he came in there, it was a consortium, but he started to operate it more like a, like a private company. I haven't finished reading the book yet, but that's. Consortiums are generally good at like mitigating downside, but they don't um, quickly make progress and iterate. So it'll be very interesting to see if they're able to make that successful. Um, long way of saying it's one of like six or seven cool projects to follow. And yeah. Coinbase, we're coin agnostic at this point. We just want to provide our customers access to anything that they think is useful as long as it's not a scam or whatever. And so this is one we're following and we're we're interested as one of the consortium members. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, I think that that's, 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 that's brilliant because it, you know, I, I think it's going to be successful. I mean, we're all betting here, and I don't really like Facebook at, in terms of what they're doing to exploit human minds. And I can say that because I don't work anywhere. But it's, but I, but it's still going to be successful just because the WhatsApp user base alone is massive. And it, you know, if we're on the page of like trying to increase financial access to people in developing countries, it's hard to see how that wouldn't help. I was just in Tanzania a few weeks ago for a secret project, but I saw M-Pesa -Pes, yeah. signs everywhere. And I was thinking about Coinbase and Bitcoin. And I was thinking, um, is there, are, like, have you guys thought about integrating with that? Like M-Pesa or any of those like African nation um, money, mo mobile money transfer services? Yeah, so um, not specifically with M-Pesa, but in general, the idea of mobile money, I think is a huge deal that's gonna um, keep, I mean, we're seeing it with like WeChat in, in China, obviously it worked really well, um, Paytm in India, M-Pesa in Africa, a, a bunch of countries, um, you know, in Indonesia and like Philippines, they all have their own kind of equivalent of these. Um, so one of the goals, that, one of the things I've been excited about for many years with crypto is that uh, we should be able to recreate that mobile money experience, but do it in not not for just like a dozen countries, but for all 200 countries and make it global. Because, yes. um, you know, 
Paytm and M-Pesa and all those are really cool, but they're not, they're, they're mostly like in-country payments. Mm -hmm. So they don't do cross-border, which crypto is inherently good at. Um, so actually this is one of the ideas behind Coinbase wallet. It's like a user controlled wallet, which makes it, um, you know, it's not a financial service product because we're not storing anybody's money. It's, it's just kind of like a software product and it allows us to launch it in more countries more quickly. Um, we're seeing early sparks there. And like, I started this charity last year called GiveCrypto.org, where we're sending, um, kind of like basic income, like small crypto payments into places like Venezuela using, um, Coinbase wallet, or actually we made a version called Coinbase wallet Lite, which runs on really old versions of Android where like 70 to 80% of people in Venezuela are still running these older versions. So, um, yeah, I, I want to recreate that kind of mobile money experience that you, I guess, sounds like you saw a little bit of with M-Pesa. Um, but using crypto and make it like a global crypto economy. I think that's that's super exciting. That's super exciting. Uh, yeah, and give crypto in particular is, is pretty exciting. How is that doing? Like there's a big Venezuelan uh, user base, but how how is, it, how is it compared to what you want? You wanted it to be from the start. Is it living up to those expectations yeah. in terms of impact? Um, so it's still really new, but positive signs. So actually this kind of gets into um, one topic I think is really interesting, which is... Um, you know, you always have like some grand vision in your head and then the early steps look really humble. <laughs> and um, usually it takes a couple of years, at least like two years in my experience for it to start to see signs of you know, like sparks of life and like real success. And then by the five year mark, it's like really working. And at 10 years mark, you can see an impact on the world. So I like to think longer term like that. Anything that's going to be able to change the world is going to take you at least 10 years. So you got to kind of mentally be prepared for that already. Long way of saying, um, just last year, probably about eight or nine months ago, I guess we um, set up Give Crypto, did the initial uh, fundraising dinner, um, raised four million from some uh, crypto people, nice. um, some early crypto people. And I put in some money, and uh, so, and then I hired, went out and did a, a search for an executive director, which is like the CEO of a charity. Uh, so I, Joe Waltman is this amazing entrepreneur who I found, and he's been doing a really great job. Um, He's got a couple developers working with him, uh, four uh, field ops people in Venezuela that he recruited. Um, they've made distributions now to about uh, 3,000 people. And, and they basically get $10 a week in crypto for about um, six weeks during this experiment, this pilot. And Joe also signed up um, a bunch of stores in Venezuela to that I, some of them were already accepting crypto and others he convinced to do that or he got the field ops people to do it. So most of the people who are receiving um, this crypto kind of UBI through it are spending the money to actually buy like food, medicine stuff. Um, so we're seeing them, I, I thought maybe they would just like cash it out to, um, you know, Venezuelan pesos, or maybe they would just hold it and think like, oh, it'll go up someday. But they're actually spending it like crypto to crypto is I think 80, like 80% 80 of them. Wow. So that was, that's an interesting data point. And the next steps for it are basically now that we've kind of proved out a little bit of it with the pilot, um, we're going to do some more fundraising later this year and hopefully get it to be 10, 20, you know, million kind of as a fund. My, my goal for it is um, to make it an evergreen fund in, in crypto that eventually gets to be, you know, 50, hundred billion dollar fund. Um, I think I want to make it the largest UBI experiment in ever, you know, basically, um, more than like, you know, Yang 2020, you know, the kind of U.S. government run UBI, like. Yeah, I mean, I, it's funny. I did the, um, I was looking one time, like, what, what is the size of like the Social Security Fund or something in the United States? And I think it was like two trillion or something. So, I mean, <laughs> you can almost play with the number, like if crypto goes up another thousand X in the next 10 years or something, it's, um, it's not, there's a lot of people who are already today have become billionaires from crypto and a lot of them are interested in philanthropy. So it's like, I mean, this might sound crazy, but if you get, a good fund together and then crypto goes up a thousand X. It could be like the size of the US Social Security Fund oh, at some shit. point. <laughs> I never thought about that, but that's a great point. I don't think it's crazy. I think that that's that's actually a great point. Wow. Yeah. I love that you're thinking about that. And so, okay. And I also like what you're saying about thinking about these projects in the long term, like 10 year spans. And I remember um, you talking about this with Chris Dixon because I was downloading all your interviews before this interview. And one concept from that that I really liked was your idea of crypto networks mm -hmm. of people and I think machines as nodes in the crypto network. And then the verbs are the edges in the network. So buy and sell. And you want to increase those the amount of verbs that people and machines can do. I wanted to extrapolate on that. Like, what's one of the most out there verbs 
that you or one of the most uh, desired dream uh, crypto verbs you would want for people to be able to do? Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, I don't always think about it as like what I can tell you. Maybe I can think of some of the crazier ones in a minute, but um, actually, I can think of a crazy one. But the, the ones we're actually focused on are the basics. So if you look at what are the basic, um, and maybe for anybody who hasn't seen that, I can just explain it quickly. Like, yep. you know, you probably, maybe some of you probably know what a social graph is like. You know, you have people and you connect via like messages and likes and things like that. Um, in an economic graph, it's similar. You know, you have these nodes which are like people or businesses or eventually bots and AI and stuff, um, and, or smart contracts and DAOs and stuff. Um, and the you know they connect via um, money or value being transferred typically, so ascend from one to the other. Um, but they can be other kinds of economic verbs too, like um, like vo voting and governance situations or um, staking, which is like a crypto concept. We can talk about if people want. Um, so the the most um, you know when when Coinbase got started, like we're all we were just about letting people invest in crypto, and that was a relatively solo activity, right? You kind of come in and check your price, how much is your portfolio now, and that honestly that that's still the majority of what people do on crypto because of the thirty million people who've signed up, they're mostly in this investment mindset. But what we realized is we can now start to connect our user base of those thirty million people into this crypto economic graph. And so we're getting them to um, do the main verbs, which are in any economy, which is like earn, you know, people need to earn a living, um, save, spend, um, invest, you know, and maybe borrow and lend. Are, those are kind of like the big ones. Um, so actually spend is the one I'm, I'm really excited about. It's like we have with Coinbase Commerce, we're trying to enable more, more stores and another whole bunch of other companies in the crypto space, by the way, BitPay and others are doing a good job with this. We need to get more, um, you know, think about the places you actually spend regular money, right? It's like rent, transportation, food, um, <laughs> taxes, stuff like that. Yeah. Amazon. <laughs> yeah, Amazon. Um, so <laughs> online education videos, you know, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, totally. So we need to get more and more places to accept crypto, like with that spending verb. And then um, they can already earn a little bit of crypto. We have a very early version of that on coinbase.com slash earn. Um, and getting borrowing and lending set up. And so that's how we're going to start to connect people into that economic graph and really build the crypto economy. Like I got, I got excited about crypto because I want people to actually use it as um, in this new economy that's faster and cheaper and more, it's more efficient, it's more fair. Like it's, it's available to everybody around the world, um, not just as a speculative investment thing. Absolutely. And, and I like the way that you look at crypto in general in the long term. So mm -hmm. spending and uh, I know that it's something like I think it's like 70 percent of Coinbase. You've kind of partitioned towards like exchange and like the, like getting people into crypto and then correct me if I'm wrong. And then 20 percent is like like um, like other investments and 10 percent is something else. Like, yeah, well, that's right. We kind of took this idea of 70, 20, 10 resource allocation because um we were always creating these new products within Coinbase. Like a lot of companies, especially at our size, they just have one product and they really focus on scaling that. And there's there's merit to that because like focus is is sometimes good. Um, for whatever reason, like I, I felt like we were at the beginning of this whole this new industry, kind of like um, 1995 when the internet was getting created or something. And I could just I just saw like opportunities all over the place. And I was like, oh my gosh, we need that piece of infrastructure and we need this exchange to be set up and we need a custodian. And then, um, and then what were all the cool apps that were gonna be built on top of this? And so I just kind of got excited as an entrepreneur. I started creating like almost too many things in the company. So we realized at a certain point we needed some balance between like build everything and, and just focus on one. So we, we come up, came, you know, we started using this framework. So 70% of our resources go to our core products, which generate the revenue today. Uh, Coinbase, the main consumer app, and then um, Pro, which is our you know platform where people trade like professional traders. Those are generating most of our revenue today. Um, then twenty percent goes on these like really key adjacent strategic bets that we need to make need to win. Like Coinbase custody is that for us today, where we've gotten now um, like two hundred institutions roughly signed up that are storing um, you know a couple billion of crypto. I think it's insane. Yeah, it's it, so the product. Insane. The product is like a year old and we just crossed uh, 2 billion AUM and, and it's growing, I think like two or 300 million a week or something. It's crazy. Um, so institutions are now really get rushing into crypto. And then 10% um, is, is kind of the new stuff, which we call venture bets. So that's where um, Coinbase Wallet came out of there, Coinbase Commerce, um, USD Coin, and there's like uh, one or two others that we're kind of currently incubating. 
Super cool. And I, and I saw, like, I was impressed with just how many startups Coinbase has already invested in, uh, which is which is insane for a relatively young company. I mean, it's been a few years, but still, like, compared to, like, IBM or something, it's super young tech company. So I can only imagine how far it's going to go. Did you ever think that, you know, when you were at those big, I remember when you were on those Bitcoin meetups in, on Mission Street and you were like talking about Coinbase and people were like, aren't you a bank, aren't you? And you were just <laughs> like, no, no, no. Did you ever imagine that it would get to this point, like where you are now? Um, you know, it sounds crazy, but yeah, I did. I really hoped that it would because, um, you know, I, I had previously worked at Airbnb and I had seen them go through this hyper growth thing. And I was like, I could do that. You know, I could build a company. <laughs> so yeah. it sounds, maybe it sounds like arrogant or something. I don't know, but I, I really did. I knew that there was a chance that it would fail and there was a lot of ways that we could mess it up along the way. But if we, if it was our game to lose, I felt like this industry is going to be really big. Um, if I just, if I just got the right people to join the company and we didn't run out of money and we kept, you know, building good products, this could easily be like, as big or bigger than Airbnb. This we could be Google, like Google yeah. and Goldman Sachs, like or something for this next industry. Absolutely. I yeah. totally agree with you on that. And you've also had some amazing partners along the way, like Fred Wilson. <laughs> it's just a beast as well. Um, I always found him to be like I'll, the most I'll tell him the I'll give him that compliment. You're, you're a beast. He I don't, is I don't a know beast. if he's ever heard he is. I agree. I don't know if he's ever heard that. I met him a few <laughs> times in New York. I was like at Columbia, like at USVN, just for like talks and stuff. Yeah. I always remember he's just like so zen. Yeah. Would you I agree. He's super chill. He's um, so chill. That's one of those things that I yeah really liked about him too. There's um, I don't, there's some people in business who get like super intense about everything and they're like really pushy and you know oh my god this is so serious and like you know and I mean I'm more I'm more in the chill camp almost sometimes to like too far because uh, I just feel like this isn't for the first couple of years of Coinbase it was like I was kind of running around like uh, super stressed all the time and like pulling all nighters. And I was, I mean, I was had it like saving the company every moment, you know? And then I realized at a certain point, like I'm going to burn out, like if I keep doing this and the only way this thing's going to work is, um, if I can keep doing this for like 10, 20 years, you know? So, um, and also a lot of those early day things were like so stressful that I, it kind of like desensitized me in a way to, so, so now sometimes the employee, the newer employees, like they kind of, um, they think I'm really weird because, uh, <laughs> something will happen like, I don't know, there's some bug and like we lose a hundred thousand dollars or something. It's like, I mean, that's not good, but I'm just like, okay, what are the, what are the steps that we're going to do to fix it? Um, and they're like, why aren't you freaking out right now? And I was like, you know, we, this is like one of 10 things we got to solve today. Let's do it. <laughs> Absolutely. So I wanted to ask you about that because I can only imagine how hard it is being, well, hard is relative, but how much pressure and responsibility it is being the CEO of this company. What do you do to relax? Do you meditate? Do you do <laughs> yoga? Do you watch Netflix? Like, what is your like chill activity to de-stress, or is being at work de-stressing? I don't know. Um, no, I mean you got to have balance. Like, if I was just to work all the time, I'd be stressed. Um, so yeah, I, I've thought a lot about that over the years. I've I, actually a lot of CEOs that I know they they get really intense about both like productivity and take relaxation. Um, there's actually a great book I read a few years ago called uh, Relax. Hmm. Um, and it's about how how to get more done by being really um, excellent at your moments of relaxation. So some, yeah, uh, you know, they, they actually go through the, like, these people like um, Alan Turing, you know, and um, Dwight Eisenhower during World War II, like talk about a stressful job. And they kind of go through like what their routines were. And um, anyway, long way of saying uh, for me, some of the things, so, you know, I try to get exercise, um, every weekday in the morning. Do you run um, or bike or? Um, just I just dirt? like, I just usually run a mile, listen to, or lift, lift some weights and I'm listening to audiobooks while I'm doing it. Oh, nice. Um, I do that too. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was weird for doing that. Nice. Yeah, no, I actually, I tried having like a personal trainer and I realized at a certain point, I don't, I didn't want to talk to anybody. The, the best part of working out was just to be in my own head. Same. And listen to like podcasts or audiobooks. Um, sometimes I'll listen to music if I just really want to, Get, get like run harder or something but um so a little bit yeah my morning routine is, is kind of important for this i think so it's um yeah so i exercise a bit i stretch i i usually meditate for 10 minutes and then um i have this like five minute journal and i write down um you know it's like three things you appreciate three things you want to get done today um just basics like that I'm trying to think what else i've had an executive coach uh for a long time um 
and I, I, different ones over the years, but you know, I think some kind of coaching, you know, is really helpful, not just to like learn how to be a better CEO, but also it's honestly, it's like a form of therapy. You know, it's like yeah. someone to talk to every couple of weeks. Um, that's been really helpful. I'm trying to think what else, I mean, food, you know, it's trying to eat healthier. Um, I used to like stress eat a lot in the office where, you know, I was just like trying to power through these days and just eat a bunch of candy and stuff like that. Oh, no. I've been getting better about that. So it's nothing rocket science. It's like probably, oh, sleep too. That's a big one. So sleep. Yeah. I got like this health tracker, you know, aura ring and it's. Oh, you got the aura? Yeah. So I've been. I've been waiting on mine. It's a few more weeks. How, how do you like it? Um, it's good. I mean, there's little things that could be better, but it's, um, in terms of just tracking sleep and everything, it's really good. So I've been getting, you know, eight hours of sleep. Yeah. Those are the big ones. Nice. I, I really like those practices. And when you say like having an executive coach, I feel like that requires a level of humility mm -hmm. that a lot of people, you know, you know, more people should have, I feel like it would be nice. It's like a good trait to have. And another thing about, uh, about humility is that you, um, I, I heard like you pay, you pay the person at lunch, or I think at lunch, who tells you the most brutal advice, 20 bucks or something? <laughs> Is that true? Uh, yeah, I mean, I do like an employee lunch once a week um, with one of the teams. And um, I one of the hard things to get as CEO sometimes is like real truth and candor. So we just created this culture doc for Coinbase, like what's the culture we wanna build? Now we have people in um, six different offices and like 800 people. So it's it's actually can drift if you don't try to really write it down. But anyway, one of, one of those is about um, candor. So, um, you know, it sounds, it sounds kind of silly because I think I'm, I'm just kind of like a normal guy, but I understand it because um, if you're new at a company and you meet me for the first time, it's like, I, who knows? There's all kinds of CEOs out there. Maybe somebody, some CEO, if you say the wrong thing, they'll fire you on the spot or who, who knows what, right? So Steve Jobs. <laughs> yeah. So um, I've tried to find different hacks to try to get people to tell me what they really think over the years. And um, one of the ways I found to do that is to gamify it. So I'll go around the room and sort of say, all right, everybody tell me one thing you think that's going really well in the company and one thing do you think could be going better. And on the thing that's going better, um, I want you to go for the thing that's maybe you're a little scared to say and uh, think about the thing that like maybe it would hurt Brian's feelings. Um, if you said it and then say that one and I'm actually going to give 20 bucks in crypto to like the person who, uh, gives me the best feedback. Um, cause yeah, I do have a lifelong learn of, uh, love of learning and, um, which is part of the reason why I loved your, uh, pot, your, uh, your videos on YouTube. I thought Thank that was you. awesome. Um, and I'm also, I do think I'm really good at, um, just, uh, like, yeah, learning and humility and getting curious about what I could be doing better, getting feedback. Um, a couple of times I've shared actually my performance review with the whole company as an, as sort of like an example that everybody can follow of like, I'm, I'm trying to get better at stuff too. So it's totally fine. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. And, and speaking of gamifying things, um, the great thing about crypto is it, it can help gamify certain activities. And mm -hmm. one of the, and you know, when, when looking at the future of crypto, what, are the and thinking about what those next um fields that it's going to enter into are so i think some of them are going to be either compute storage mm -hmm. or bandwidth like those are the three um and fred wilson was talking about this as well mm -hmm. but if i were to bet um what the next one is going to be i would say it's going to be in storage something with storage because that's so desperately needed like aws needs to be redone you know, with crypto, but, uh, what would you say? Like, like, which do you think is going to be the next that's going to be gamified with crypto, like mm -hmm. a decentralized version of one of those three? Yeah. So, I mean, I do agree with the general idea that, um, in terms of compute resources that are out there, you know, people always talked about those memory and compute and bandwidth and storage. And I do think crypto is almost like a new fundamental primitive of computing, uh, resources. And you, you could imagine a world in the future where, um, every server or machine or bot or, you know, IOT device does have a little bit of crypto on it. Um, hopefully, you know, Android robots, you know, strong AI running around here soon. Um, and they'll have their, they'll have a little bit of crypto cause they're using that to like call APIs with other things and, you know, boot up more memory when they need it. Um, there's a couple of really cool crypto projects out there working on that. Um, GPU type stuff too. And, um, TPU is probably soon. I, I imagine, I don't know if anybody's doing that one. Mm. Um, 
But uh, I don't, I mean, I don't have like a, I always, you know, I don't, I don't have a bet about which one's going to happen first. Um, we always try to be like kind of coin agnostic mm -hmm. and just support all the projects out there. Totally. But, um, you know, that's one of those ideas. It's like a lot of things in technology, it's, you know, it's going to happen over the next 10 years, but whether it's going to happen in the next two years is really hard to say. It's kind of like, um, you know, for many years, like VR or AI or whatever, it was like, um, I was like, is this the one? And then there was like kind of a winter and then it re had a revival. So um, crypto has been going through lots of those. So we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Well said. We'll see. Um, so uh, speaking about AI, speaking about machine learning technology, I know that Coinbase must be using it in several different ways. What's one of the use cases that you find particularly interesting at Coinbase? Yeah. I mean, one of the ones that's really interesting is... Um, you can imagine that any kind of website where people come in and put in um, a credit card or bank account or you know some kind of payment method, and then um, they can buy you know irreversible digital currency and withdraw it off the site. Um, there might be challenges around fraud, right? And so um, that's actually one of the hardest problems to run a company like Coinbase is um, preventing people from putting in uh, kind of stolen or fraudulent payment methods and um, you know, it's a really, it's a really hard problem. So we've used successfully uh, machine learning for that really since almost, you know, I'd say since 2012, like a very early version of the product, maybe 2013. Yeah. Something like that. So, and every year we keep getting better and better models and we keep, we keep getting better and better data, like signals and inputs to it. So, you know, at this point there's, um, at least hundreds, maybe 500, I'm not sure the exact number. Um, of kind of various signals and data points like going into these models. And um, it's a huge it's a huge lever on our profitability. Like just to give you a kind of a simple example, let's say that you know you charge a 1% fee. So you someone buys $100 of crypto and you get $1. Um, if, some, if there's like a reversal on that payment method, a chargeback and the person's already, because it, it was a stolen card or something, and the $100 of crypto has already been sent off the site, so you have to pay, um, you know, the hundred dollars back to the for the chargeback, um, but you also lost the hundred dollars of crypto. So on your one dollar fee, you you lost two hundred dollars. So it takes you like two hundred legitimate transactions to go make up for that one uh, fraudulent one. So long way of saying our fraud rate is something we measure really closely and keep building better stuff with machine learning. I love that. And one thought I had while you were saying that was like this is one of those cases where you don't want open source. Um, algorithms like machine learning is all about open sourcing everything. But you know, you if you guys open source what you're doing, then people can can hack it, right? Yeah, they could look for weaknesses in it that way. Um, I know, like Reddit, for instance, is open source, but their um, like fraudulent post detection algorithm is like the one closed source piece. Mm -hmm. You know, and like the libraries they use for those, like TensorFlow, can be open source, mm -hmm. but the actual way that we use it and what signals is probably going to be closed source forever. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. So speaking about AI, I've got to ask you the obligatory AI question. Elon Musk has talked about this, Stephen uh -huh. Hawking, all the big names. What are your thoughts on, um, do you think that there's going to be any kind of AI apocalypse in the future? Uh, what do you think about um, the, f the far term of AI? Like where, where are we headed with this technology? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I mean, let me just say, I, I don't, I'm not qualified to like predict the future there. And I, I mean, I read about it because I think it's super interesting. Um, I can share my high level thoughts, but I definitely don't claim to have a crystal ball here. <laughs> I think right, right. Pe people always have like very high conviction about these things. And I mean, uh, it's really hard to say. The future is very hard to predict. But um, I don't know. My high level thoughts, I mean, number one is that um, there's been this long tradition of technology um, improving automation and sort of uh, taking jobs. And so, but you know, it doesn't seem like the unemployment rate is dramatically affected. If you go back and look at um, the industrial revolution or like tractors being introduced when, when farming was there, or, you know, there's these kind of funny examples of like, it used to be that there's people who operated elevators, right? I guess the, the bellman or whatever it was called. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if you go back in those times, it's like, oh, they have automated elevators now. And it's like, would you trust your elevator ride to a robot? You know, and they're taking our jobs with the, the people in the elevators. So I think, I think that trend has been happening for a long time. And so in some ways, AI is a big deal. And, you know, but is it a bigger deal than like the industrial revolution? Like, I'm not sure. So I think part of me, I'm not as worried about the job thing, but you were, you were kind of asking about um, the killer robots, I guess, the right. apocalypse. 
Um, I, my high level thinking on that is like, um, I think it's gonna, I, I've read the sort of horror stories of like, you know, AI decides it wants to make more paper clips. And so it just, it just steps on in like an anthill in the road, not cause it hates humans, but it's just, it was in the way. I, my guess is that, um, humans and AI will somehow kind of merge. Um, and they're just different versions of intelligence. Um, I think whether you get intelligence from like biological life or synthetic life, I don't, I don't, I'm one of those people who thinks like the underlying algorithm is like not that different. I don't think there's some special property to like consciousness. Um, so whether it's Neuralink type stuff or, or kernel, just gotta say kernel. Yeah. Or, um, you know, I, I think there'll be, we'll be in a world here soon where, um, biological life kind of gets a lot smarter. So does, um, digital life and, you know, digital life or AI might be the successor to like biological evolution. And I mean, that's kind of okay. I think, you know, um, I think that's all right. There's sometimes I have this debate with my friends, you know, my other <laughs> futurist friends, which is like, some people call it green or gray, like, you know, because you can imagine with CRISPR and genetic en engineering, digital or biological life is could have huge gains as well. Mm. Um, so is it going to be biological life or digital life? It's funny if you, there was like this photo somebody showed me one time where it was like a desk at an office and it had, you know, like a, a monitor, an LED monitor and like an iPhone and a keyboard. And then it had like a little plant in the corner. And I was like, what's the most complex thing on this desk? And, um, you know, people were like, well, of course it's like the iPhone or whatever. And in some ways, digital life seems like it has a huge advantage because, um, it just runs off electricity and you can have these huge data centers and, um, it's, you know, Moore's law and it's accelerating so amazingly well. Digital life has some advantages too. Like, um, you know, that little plant, like if you cut off, um, one of the branches, like it grows back just with water and sunlight, you know, or you can take a seed and like make a new plant out of it. It's like, imagine if you had your, your iPhone and you like broke off like a little corner of it, planted it in the ground and like you had a new iPhone, you know, and, and it self, like a self healing, self replicating system. So digital life, um, hasn't quite gotten there yet, but, um, I don't know. I, I think, I think the future is going to be awesome one way or another. I I'm sort of an optimist for no good reason other than I think that's just how I'm wired. So, yeah, no, I, I, I think you, I mean, I think you're a data driven optimist. I mean, you're, you see things and, um, yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. I'm pretty optimistic. I think uh, speaking on that note and just being here at Coinbase and combining my crypto and AI vibes together, I'm I'm thinking about like decentralized autonomous organizations. Yeah. And then like some kind of, some kind of AI that like amasses all this wealth and nobody controls it. And then it just like takes over all the financial markets. And, <laughs> but hopefully, you know, that's not going to happen uh, in, in, in the long in the long term. But uh, speaking about decentralized applications, um, one thing that I was really into a couple years ago, but I got totally disillusioned with was decentralized social networks. Mm. I thought, you know, I was just off and on my timing, I think. But um, it, do you use any decentralized social networks? Because I don't. Like I've Steemit, kind of, but. Yeah, I've tried some of them um, as demos, like, you know, Steemit. There was a couple of Twitter clones um, that I tried. Um, there's actually some, these are more like, I would say in VR, like metaverse type social things like Decentraland and things like that. I think those are all really cool and they have potential. Um, I agree. I don't think they're going to be like the first thing that takes off. Um, one thing that needs to get fixed for that is the scalability of these of these protocols and blockchains. Because, um, yeah, I think you're going to need to get really high transaction throughput to sort of start to build applications at that scale. Um, luckily there's a bunch of people working on that. And some of those six or seven I mentioned when we were talking about Libra, like are very focused on scalability. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and it's really cool to see that there are these entrepreneurs who are dedicated to making this stuff happen, even though there are so many issues, both in terms of scalability and, you know, et cetera. Um, but in general, I, I love entrepreneurial culture. I, I think there should be more entrepreneurs in the world. I know that one of, um, the, you know, I, I know that the way you view, Coinbase's mission is, is kind of solving this meta problem of increasing, uh, by making a more open financial system for the world, mm -hmm. we can increase the number of entrepreneurs in the world. Um, do you, do you feel like, um, there's one thing that Coinbase could do that would help, um, help increase the number of entrepreneurs in the world? Or do you think it's just like a general, you, you have a lot of problems to solve, or is there like mm. one, um, key issue that could be solved? And then if you do that, 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 that metric goes, up. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, the main, the one thing that we're trying to solve, if you had to zoom out and just put a label on it, um, like you said, an open financial system, um, I think of it as like economic freedom, right? So it's kind of this very, um, there's an idea that a lot of us sort of take for, take for granted, but it's actually not that common in the world, which is that if I do something awesome and a lot of people benefit from it and I, and I capture some wealth from that to help, you know, take care of my family or whatever, will I be able to keep that wealth? Um, that is in at least a necessary condition for there to be more entrepreneurs. It may actually be a sufficient condi condition on its own um, because it's easy to forget that through most of human history, um, you know, if you did something, like you started to accumulate a bunch of resources or you, you know, it's probably some like king or warlord or emperor would kind of just take that away from you or it would get stolen from you by thieves in the night or whatever. And so it, the Industrial Revolution arguably was kicked off by this idea, you know, starting off in the UK that you could actually, property rights, basically. It was like, if you, if you, you own belongs to you, it's not like serfdom or whatever. Um, and if you try hard and you hustle and you build something great that helps people, whether it's like selling, you know, some stuff on a corner store or building the next like great technology company, um, you can build a better life for yourself. There's like upward mobility, you know, that's a super empowering idea that many people in the world still don't have. Um, they don't believe that wealth can ever really be stored or captured. And so they're kind of, they kind of just keep their head down and like, don't try very hard. Um, so that's one, I think crypto, that's like one of the secrets that I think Coinbase is based on is this idea that, um, with cryptocurrency and the smartphone revolution, we can inject economic freedom into all these countries all over the world um, and get people to try harder and build cool stuff. Absolutely. Um, is, is China one of those countries? Yeah, I mean, China is um, has amazing potential as an economy, but it's not very economically free. Uh, you know, people get oppressed all the time and um, there's a lot of corruption and things like that. So. China would benefit enormously from um, cryptocurrency in that regard. And they already are super interested in cryptocurrency. So. That is very cool. I know a lot of the Bitcoin mines are based in China. So they've got a lot of power in that way. Speaking of other countries, and um, I know you spent, a, I think it was a year in Argentina? Yeah. Okay, that's that's a good amount of time. This what was, was what back was that? around maybe 2009, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it was like before Coinbase. Um, yeah. You had a even before that, I think you had a tutoring site even before that as well. Yeah. It's quite a while ago. Let's just say like, for example, you had no responsibilities at all and you had, were tasked with spending a year in a foreign country. <laughs> do, do you know uh, what country that would be or do you think you would uh, spend it in San Francisco? Or I'm just um, Yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of places that I haven't been yet, but I, I mean, um, I think places like Singapore are really interesting in, the, in terms of economic freedom and Hong Kong. Um, New Zealand, you know, places like that are really yeah. interesting. So Naval really likes New Zealand. Yeah. I, I've, I don't know if you've been seeing this guy kind of exodus of, from Silicon Valley to New Zealand. Oh, because of the, like, like legal, like the immigration laws and the, also just like the entrepreneurial laws. Yeah. Um, I've seen people getting dual citizenship there, but I haven't seen it as a exodus yet from the U S but it's kind of more like a, a backup plan, but I think they're doing a really good job of attracting entrepreneurial people there as like, Hey, this is a this is a land of freedom and opportunity where we we value people who build new things, help grow the economy. So that's I think a lot of um, people that I interact with, they're you know they're interested in how do we create um, startup countries or ec special economic zones, right? Because um, I know a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with this idea, like it, you know whether it's self driving cars or drone delivery or new types of medical devices or um, cryptocurrency or whatever, it sometimes feels like uh, it's the, one of the hardest things about building something new is just navigating the unclear uh, legal or regulatory environment around it. And so um, having a place where you can go test out ideas, um, I think I think there should be more of those, like more special economic zones in the world. There, there could be one that's, it doesn't have to be all like tech stuff. It could be there's one that's really about environmentalism or, um, you know, whatever social policies people are interested in and try, there should be a hundred or a thousand experiments and that could, inf just like in startups, right? Like if a startup starts to get traction, there's a thousand startups and one of them gets traction. Well, that infl that changes like the big companies in how they think, or maybe they acquire it. Um, how cool would that, like democracy is this amazing thing that got created 
US in 1776, but it's kind of slower to innovate. How cool would that be if they saw like a small economic zone um, introduce some policy and it's really going amazingly well and then the US could adopt it. It's like, it's already kind of proved out on a smaller scale. So that'd be cool. That would be super cool. Um, yeah, so last question. Uh, so you went to Rice. Are you, you're not? Are you from Houston? No, I grew up in Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, in San Jose, California. Actually. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Is that, um, yeah, what was your experience like in Houston? I mean, I liked Rice a lot. Uh, I'm from Houston. That's why. Okay. Cool. It's <laughs> interesting. Yeah. I mean, um, it's funny. Like, I my, my dream was like to go to MIT for some reason. I had never been there, but I was like, I want to go to MIT, but I didn't get in. So then mm -hmm. I was like, I went to a bunch of other schools and interviewed. And then I almost went to school in California um, at Berkeley or somewhere like that. It's, the CS program was really good. But I was like, I think I want to get out of California and just go see other parts of the world. Um, so I, I spent a weekend at Rice uh, just kind of touring it. And I really loved it. I had such a great experience. Um, There's so many smart people, like the really good engineering school. Um, Houston was fun. So I, I enjoyed it. Did you ever go to this restaurant called Nico Nico's? It's like this like Greek. Sounds yeah. familiar. Second Why? Montrose. All right, I was my yeah. favorite restaurant. Really? I'm just like <laughs> random. Okay, so actually, I just had one more. So real last question. Yeah. Real last question. Uh, what is, I mean, so I'm sure, you know, you mentioned some books here. What's like your favorite book ever? Is there one? <laughs> or um, I don't know if I have like a favorite book ever, but um, I'll give you a couple ideas. So, you know, Paul Graham's writing actually really influenced oh, yes. me a lot. Um, there's a... One thing I'm really interested in is just usability of products, and I try to focus on that at Coinbase and help our product managers think about it. So there was a great book I read there called uh, Don't Make Me Think by Steve Krug. Um, there's, uh, you know, actually reading about like Ray Kurzweil and the singularity, his idea about singularity was like very influential on me. You read that book, Singularity is Near? I read like a summary of it. I don't think I even read the whole thing, nice. but I, the Props idea to admitting that nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the idea was very influential. Um, so I, there's actually a blog post I put out called like 15 books that changed the way I think. Um, and, uh, that's, that's, that's my nice. good list. Yeah. I, I, I didn't find that for some reason. I gotta, I gotta go back. Yeah. It's on medium somewhere. It's on medium somewhere. Okay, cool. I gotta yeah. check that out. It's weird because when I started this YouTube channel, um, I was all about the singularity is near. We got to get more people to do it. Yeah. And it's weird because after being so into this, these statistical techniques, which is what they are that have been around for decades, I'm kind of, I've kind of even become disillusioned with the idea that we're going to create some kind of system that can love and feel emotions in the way that we do. Um, and it's weird because if you look at like the head of open AI, I, I just, today I responded to, I, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Wojcik Saremba. Mm. He was saying like, AGI will happen. It's only a matter of time when. And mm -hmm. I'm like, first show me a working example of causal reasoning. <laughs> and then we'll talk about AGI will happen for sure. Until yeah. then it's speculation. Right. But um, yeah, I, I hope the singularity happens. I hope that we create a system that can solve all of our immense problems in the world, like climate change and all of these yeah. existential threats. Um, but yeah, I, I think Kurzweil's writing was uh, pretty interesting. Uh, have you met him before? No, I've no, not really. I've seen him at talk, give talks and stuff. But um, yeah, I agree with you. I think the, the singularity can get a little weird in the sense that it's like it's going to happen so soon, like, and then it feels um, feels like it's uh, the boy who cried wolf or something. Yeah. Um, and then also it just it starts to feel like it's like a religion at some point, which yes. I think the more just normal version of it is that um, the main insight from Kurzweil that I really liked was that it's not just that. Um, Technology is improving things, which seems relatively obvious if you think about fire and this, you know, we're all wearing shoes. People think of these things as technology is like iPhones, we're addicted to it. It's like, well, I wear shoes every day. You know, that was like technology. technology <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, but um, the main insight he had was that it's not just improving, it's accelerating. That was like the main insight. And so to me, I don't know if it's going to happen like a blink of an eye and suddenly the whole world's different or whatever. I don't know if that's going to happen, but I think it's. I think it's just things just keep getting better. And that's actually one thing I'm just really passionate about in my own life is um, how do you accelerate the pace of innovation in the world and improvement? Not because we have to do that. Like the world is fine today. I'm, I'm relatively happy, you know, like <laughs> there's lots of good things to celebrate, but um, I just think it's fun. Like for me, I like building things. I like learning things. So if I can help accelerate the world uh, improvement through technology, that's, that's probably what I can best do in the world. Totally. We're on the same page. 
Awesome. So, um, guys, if you are a good engineer and you want to help Brian with his mission, definitely apply to Coinbase. They are hiring. Uh, and thank you so much for being here, Brian. Thanks for having me. This was great. Awesome. Awesome.